This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse, here with your co-host, Bill Hamill. I'm so much more comfortable collecting real estate than I am collecting other stuff. This is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Purse, here with your co-host, Bill Hamill. This was our first afternoon podcast recording, a little different today. We interviewed Senate Eskridge. He is a multifamily investor, also a student of the Jake and Gino community. Bill, what'd you think? Yeah, Senate's great. He's got a unique way of looking at things. Very ambitious guy. Very, very goal oriented. I love what he has going on in Idaho. That's for sure. Another real estate podcast that ended talking personal development and mindset. Somehow we always we always end in that direction. Yeah, people at this level that we deal with, it, it goes hand in hand. There, there's no way to really scale in this business if you don't have the right mindset for it. And you definitely hear more about that in this episode. That's it. Turning a 10-year goal into a six-month goal. Senate Eskridge, really excited to have you here today on the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. I've heard great things from Bill. Let's get right into it. Tell us how you got into the real estate industry. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here as well. So, you know, my story begins, uh, like some others that you've you've heard before, uh, right after 2008, I had to move and I had a house I just couldn't sell. You know, nobody wanted to buy houses but it was apparent that I absolutely had to move. It was a big cost savings, big time savings. And so I went and I moved, I bought another house and now I had two mortgages. What do you do with two mortgages, right? Uh, So I decided to rent that house out. And uh, after a few months and having this cash flow come in, truthfully, I just kind of fell in love and decided if I can do it with one house, why can't I do it with another? And so that's exactly what I did. I went and bought another one. And then uh, the third one was kind of a junker and I'm going to fix it up. And uh, before I could move somebody into it, before I could get it rented out, somebody came and offered me a bunch of money for it. So now I went from being an accidental landlord to an accidental flipper. <laughs> so I flipped this house. And I did that a few different times and learned a lot of lessons throughout the, throughout the, the way, you know, and I, I had a bunch of bumps and bruises and had extra expenses that everybody had, and, uh, had to learn. Right. So I went and I got a few books, uh, spent a lot of time on bigger pockets. Uh, I read, uh, David Green's the Burr method, probably five or six times and, and went through that process multiple different times, asked a ton of questions. And finally got up to the point where I had 14 properties. And I kept at that point running into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And I decided that I had to do something different. So I went and looked at every other aspect of real estate that you could imagine. I looked at becoming an agent. I didn't want to do that. I looked at uh, self storage. I looked at industrial. I looked at retail. <clears throat> All of those just seemed like I'd have to start over and learn new things. And when I looked at multifamily, it just made a ton of sense because I had all this experience already with duplexes and triplexes and having all those uh, 14 properties. I already have property managers in place. So it just made sense that uh, multifamily was the way to go. But how, how do you buy a $10 million building? (laughs) I didn't know, right? So I decided to hire a mentor. First time in my life I've had a big paid mentor like that. So obviously that's a big deal, right? So I went and I looked at every mentorship program that I could find, get my hands on, listened to a ton of podcasts, absorbed a bunch of free content before I did that. March 1st last year, so what are we at? 16 months. I joined a program called Jake and Gino. One of the best decisions I've ever made. I'm a big fan of their program. Uh, they've helped me in so many ways, but the biggest one was teaching me how to buy multifamily properties and giving me a connection of people that allow me to be able to run those assets after I buy them. 
So I decided to start selling all of my single family assets and move everything into multifamily. And from that journey, March 1st last year, I have grown to just over 300 doors today. And February, the end of February, 1st of March this year, so roughly a year after uh, going into multifamily, I went full time. I left my W 2 job. And actually, as of just this last week, uh, this is the first podcast I've announced it on. Our friends at Jake and Gino have hired me on as a coach to help teach other people how to buy multifamily assets. I'm very excited about my journey and looking forward to the next several years as I continue to grow this. Wow, that's fantastic news. Congratulations on that. That's, uh, that is very complimentary. I'm excited for you there. What I am interested in, now that you mentioned the, the Jake and Gino, going from that roadblock, if you can elaborate, what, what does that mean that you, you dealt with the roadblock? Yeah, you know, there, there's actually three different roadblocks that I that I felt like I was coming up against on a regular basis when I left. The reasons I left single family moved to multifamily. So the biggest one was time. 14 properties that you have to manage on, on a regular basis just take a ton of time. You know, you've all heard the three T's of real estate, right? Tenants, toilets, termites, right? The three troubles. <clears throat> And just kept running out of time on a, on a regular basis. The next biggest hurdle that I had was lending. When I went to my bank and I asked them for the 11th loan, they basically laughed. You know, you're not going to get any more loans from us. I'm sorry. You got to figure something else out. And I kept having that problem over and over and over again. But then, then the other one was I ran out of money. Mm. I just didn't have any more money that I, I could invest. And so it was just so hard to scale. And the return on that money just uh, much better off in, in the bigger commercial spaces. So a couple of quick questions to try and paint a picture of where you were at that time. Those 14 properties, were they all single family? No, thanks for clarifying that. So I had some duplexes, some triplexes, and even okay. a fourplex at one time. And yeah. you were working W-2 at the time? I was, yeah. Yeah, W-2. Uh, so yeah, definitely run out of time on a regular basis. And those properties were all local. Yeah, very close to me. Probably the furthest one was maybe 60 miles. Okay. And, and so what is, what is local close. for you yeah. for anyone listening? I'm, uh, I'm in twin falls, Idaho. Yeah. Okay. And we've seen a lot of growth in Idaho. Is that where you're continuing to look for these large multifamily assets as that price keeps flying up or are you trying to look around the country. It's a little bit of both actually. So I, I definitely am looking very actively in Idaho. We've got just about 70 doors right now in Idaho. And then we also have properties in Oklahoma and in Columbus, Ohio. And then I'm actively looking right now at some properties in the Texas area and in the Florida area. All right. So you're choosing uh, several different markets here. Let me ask you, as far as joining that Jake and Gino program, and you saw so much value teaching you how to get into multifamily properties, why don't you explain what, what areas did you gain that knowledge and what type of properties have you gotten into and what type of deal structures do they look like? It's a lot to unpack in there, Bill. I'll do my best to hit all of those points. <clears throat> you know, one of the one of the biggest lessons that I learned when I very first started in multifamily is it's it's not a a solo sport, right? They say it's a team sport. You need multiple different partners and multiple different people uh, that have that specialize in different aspects of real estate. So, uh, personally, for me, my my focus has been on uh, deal acquisitions, underwriting, and uh, capital raising. So I'm really heavily focused in the front part of, of getting a deal put together. And then my suspicion is, I haven't done this yet, but when we end up selling a uh, multifamily property, I'll also be involved in the dispositions as well. Uh, then I have partners that, that really kind of work on the middle, the middle ground. 
I could not do any of the things that I do without those partners, <clears throat> which is why I'm able to work in multiple different parts of the country. Uh, I have uh, friends that are in uh, the Texas area that I work with really closely as they go and look at assets and then I help them bundle that around and I take help them help them close that property. Similarly with Oklahoma and and the uh, Florida area and then myself and my partner Chris Carney we're, we're the ones that do that uh, in Idaho right so we're the boots on the ground or the local people here in Idaho. As far as a uh, deal structure like let's dive into that I've done I've done uh, joint ventures right which is just where there's a small group of people that get together and buy a property on their own and then we've actually completed a 506b syndication which is where we actually hire a SEC attorney and we file it with uh, file it with the states and, and different entities across the country that we can actually pool people's money together that one was a lot of fun uh, big learning experience for us and, and we're working on our second one right now what were some of those learning points during that syndication process? Because there's a lot that goes into it. Oh, man, you're not kidding. I, I would say the biggest learning is uh, everything takes more time than you think it will. I always hear twice as long and twice as expensive as you predict. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we didn't have a lot of expenses that we didn't predict, but definitely a few. Uh, the twice as long, though, for sure. Luckily, we had built in extensions into our purchase and sale agreement, which is something I highly recommend. You know, don't go into any when you submit an offer in onto a property, make sure that you have built in extension provisions. And of course, we had to pay extra earnest money for those built in provisions, but they were there. And if we didn't have those, uh, we probably would have lost the deal just because everything took longer. So how, how long was the initial contract period? And then how long was that extension for that possible extension, extension option? Yeah. So the contract uh, period was for 60 days uh, from, from, well, so hold on back up. We did all of our due diligence ahead of time, right? So we really didn't need a due diligence period. And we had most of our financing and stuff really lined up. So the 60 days was just to get our ducks in a row. And then we had a built in 30 day extension on there uh, for you know whatever whatever the problem is <clears throat> and to do that we actually had to double our earnest money hard so when we when we executed that contract we had to be 100 percent sure that we were going to be able to move forward so it was a total of 90 days and then we actually closed uh three days early so it was an 87 day period that it took us to do it that's awesome. So three days early. So the, the clock was ticking and you got it done. Tell us about getting under contract and having 60 days before that extension period. You did the due diligence before you signed that PSA? Well, let's, let's start over and, and start at the very beginning of the, of the story. Because <clears throat> really, there's a lot of missing pieces there. We actually looked at the property I'm thinking of. Uh, it was really close to us. Uh, it's uh, roughly an hour and a half from my house. And we actually uh, walked through that property uh, four or five months before we actually purchased it. We had an offer on the table to, to the seller that was verbally accepted. And before we could get everything in contract, somebody came in with a higher offer with cash. Mm. So we had everything all done at one point and then the offer fell out because of that other cash offer. Long story short, that cash offer, quote unquote, cash offer fell apart. They couldn't, they couldn't execute on the deal. So the seller brought, brought it back to us and said, you can have, you can have the uh, contract if you match their price. So we did, we checked the math, made sure that everything was still good. And so we, and it was, so we decided to move forward. So we had a huge head start. All we had to do at that point was a physical walkthrough of all the properties. So when I said all the due diligence, physical walkthrough of all the properties, and uh, we actually had to also go through all the leases, a little bit, a little bit of legal due diligence, but we were done probably within seven days. Uh, maybe maybe 10 at the most. So we, we just had that really big head start. 
So you just great. needed that 60 days to get the financing set. Yep. Yeah. Just, we had to order, uh, we had to order uh, appraisals and, and inspections for the lender, that type of thing. And so the financing wasn't a problem. It was the, uh, the syndication piece that took a little bit longer than we expected. It's a great real world example of buying a large multifamily asset. This is the Collecting Real Estate Show. Sounds like a good addition to your collection. Since we're already that far deep into talking about that property, tell us where you are today. How has that gone? Was it a value add? Is it being repositioned right now? You know, so it's, it's actually a really good value add through operation, right? Not renovation, you know, that cliche stay, saying that we've all heard several times, right? To, to increase value through management. We have to put a little bit of money into it. So it was a, a $3.3 million purchase. So it's not a giant asset, but we only put uh, $300,000 worth of renovations into it. So it's not a lot of physical renovations. It's primarily all a management play. So we're instituting uh, rubs or you know the ratio utility billing system where we're billing the tenants back for all of the utilities and cleaning things up, getting, a, getting rid of a few, um, let's say undesirables on the property. Uh, we put in some uh, dog poles, so there would be people clean up after their pets, clean up some barbecue grills, things of that nature. And we uh, are able to increase the rents uh, every new lease. It's about a 40% rent bump, right? <clears throat> now, as we're going through all these turns, we're actually hitting year two of performa, performa on our rents. Now, I don't want to take 100% credit for that, right? We're a little bit of the victim of the market. Everything's going really fast. As you alluded to, Idaho's really hot. Uh, but it's really a testament to having an excellent asset manager, an asset manager that's not afraid to push the envelope. It's not afraid to be able to go out there and ask for higher rents and take that gamble and then do what it needs to be done to be able to get those rents to happen, right? And I, and I credit my partner for that 100%. As I mentioned, I'm really involved in the beginning. He takes care of 100% of that middle. And he's one of the most impressive asset managers I've ever met. Uh, and I'm very, very glad to have Chris Carney on my team. So he does a great job in that, in that regard. No, that's so awesome. I'm listening to that. So Chris, so does he have some operations experience where he's able to deal with that property manager and show the manager his vision and, and what he's looking to do? And how did that manager react when the asset manager owners want to get super aggressive because the, the property manager's on the front line? How did, how did that go? Yeah. So, so Chris's experience, his background is in IT management. And so he, it, what I mean by that, he's not an IT person necessarily. Like he's not actually programming computers or anything like that. He would actually manage IT departments and manage uh, big uh, budgets for renewing computers and renewing servers and, and taking a project from A to Z. And when I say budgets, I mean, big numbers, you know, millions of dollars for multi-million dollar corporations. He actually had plants all over the country. I, I don't know the exact number, so I don't want to quote them. But when you've got when you've got physical operations in multiple states across the country, you're a pretty good project manager. So when we started looking at running a, you know, three to five million dollar apartment building, it was a no brainer that he was the right fit for this job. So he can take a business plan and be able to execute it through exactly what you talked about, delegating and managing people. So he would figure out what the rents need to be by looking at market comps and working with that property manager and then tell them what his expectations are. And then he's able to hold them accountable when they push back and say, I'm not sure you want to do that. He's actually able to back it up with data that says, yes, yes, I do want to do that. And uh, he, he's one of the most direct and authentic people I've ever met. So when he tells somebody he wants somebody to do something, they do it. So you're getting the 40% increases. You're already on the second year of your pro forma. I'm expecting some type of waterfall here in the near future. Are you planning for a refinance or a sale? And, and how are you analyzing the, the rising rates? And how does that affect your decision there? Well, so the original plan 
the original plan was that we would refinance it in approximately year three. And uh, we were going to give 60% of the uh, investors money back to them to roll into the next deal. Right. So let's just say you've given me a hundred thousand dollars to invest in this property. Uh, I'm going to give you a check for $60,000 and I'm going to have another, another project right here, ready for you to invest in. Right. And just continue to roll it and snowball that investment to keep continuing growing it. And that's still the plan that we're marching towards. Now I constantly watch the rates and uh, we're always updating our analyzer to be able to get to that point and figure out what is going to happen. No one has a crystal ball, right? So we don't know for sure what's going to happen in the next year. <clears throat> but one thing that everybody learns about me real quickly is I like to under promise and over deliver, right? So my actual underwriting, the original underwriting, I didn't tell any of my people this, right? But it actually said I was going to be able to give back 72% of their money. I told them all 60, right? So uh, if that that's going to be for that buffer, right? So if the rates continue to rise, we can actually get up to six and a quarter percent and still be able to meet our performance. We're not there yet. Who knows what's going to happen with rates? Uh, if it gets over six and a quarter, we might have a little bit of a problem. Uh, but luckily, we've got a 10 year loan on this, right? We're not in any hurry if, if we have to. If we have to wait it out another year, we're just going to have to time the refinance. Yeah, but I'm also seeing it's 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 a race to refi for a lot of us for that obvious reason. We're able to reposition quicker than we expected because of this rent growth. We're all spoiled by this market rent growth, which is fantastic, unprecedented, absolutely amazing. And then seeing it being repositioned, but then going to refi and the commercial lenders love to see that seasoning before they're ready to give you that 80% loan to value and you're not able to maximize as, as, as fast as you'd like. So I can see the importance with your underwriting where we create that bridge. You have a very conservative interest rate for year two when you do refi and you're able to roll that money on your assets in Oklahoma City and Columbus. What do those partnerships look like? Are they more experienced investors who have had years in the business? How do they look? Yeah, great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so those were early on in our in our uh, careers in my career of being a being a multifamily investor. And I've always believed in learning from other people. So that's exactly what it is. I found a, a very experienced uh, owner, very experienced operator that I uh, really trusted. And I was able to come alongside them and invest with them and then be able to get that experience and be a, be a member of the team. Although it's a smaller piece, right? I don't own a large piece of the equity, but I'm actually to, able to be a member of the team, be able to build my credibility, be able to build my resume, and also learn, right? That was the biggest thing for me. I can see all their things that they're doing, learn from their experience, learn from their mistakes, because they've made a couple, right? Let's be honest, we all do. Mm -hmm. Learn from their mistakes so I don't make the same ones. Even if it's a very small amount of equity, having that GP position, like for all those reasons you just mentioned, is so important to, to grow your resume and grow your career in this industry. You mentioned being a part of the acquisition side of things, and that really intrigued me because I first had a career in sales, and I still cold call property owners, and I, I love that part of the business. But I do have a hard time managing my outreach, even just in two cities, being Schenectady, New York, and Tampa, Florida. You're invested across the country. Are you only focusing your outreach in one city, or are you looking all over the place? How are you growing a network if it is all over? And what kind of systems do you use for that outreach? Is there a certain CRM or a system that you follow? Yeah, great, great questions. You know, I, I believe in specializing in one or two things and then uh, leveraging other people to diversify, right? So specifically what I mean by that is my outreach is all in Southern Idaho and in Oklahoma, primarily in Tulsa, Oklahoma specifically, but Oklahoma's, Oklahoma and Idaho are small enough areas 
that you you reach out to one broker and they work in multiple cities, right? So th those are the two areas that I specialize my outreach on. Those are where I'm primarily focused on and getting building connections, networking, those type of things. And a lot of it is just calling brokers primarily, right? I'm calling brokers on a, on a regular basis, introducing myself, telling them what I've done, telling them what I want to do and growing that. And that's my primary focus. The rest of my efforts are all through other partners, right? So I've got uh, other people that focus in the San Antonio area, the Houston area, right? That that's all they do is, is they focus in that area. I've got another group of people that I work with that do direct to seller. And what I mean by direct to seller is like what you talked about. They pick up the phone and they call property owners and they do, I don't know how many, 20 calls a day or something where they're constantly calling property owners. Right. And so we leverage each other's skill sets back and forth. So I specialize in one thing or one or two areas, and then I diversify through other specialists. Now for the right. second part, how do you keep track of it all? Cause I know a lot of people who they'll call, they'll call five brokers on a Thursday and then they forget about it and they don't reach out to that broker again for two months. And when that broker gets a deal, they're not calling that guy back cause you reached out once. So how do you keep track of all these different brokers that you're talking with across two different states? And how do you put that on your calendar to keep in touch with them? Yeah, I, I don't believe that anybody that doesn't have a good system to be able to do follow up is going to be successful in any kind of a sales business. I have a CRM. It's actually a specialized CRM uh, called uh, Customer Factory. You can't just go buy it. You actually have to get it from a marketing agency. And it's, uh, it's a piece of my overall website and marketing campaign uh, that, that I use. And just like any, any other CRM, whether it be Pipedrive or uh, Salesforce and those type of things, you log in there, what contacts you made, make notes about the contact, and then you schedule another follow-up. And then it comes up and it says on Monday, you said you were going to call these four or five people and you call those four or five people, make notes and you schedule the next follow up. It also is uh, able to keep track of investors in the same way. So I've got one section over here for brokers, section over here for investors and the one or two property owners that I'm working with. It also keeps track of all of those for me. The other nice thing is, is it does all of my emails, right? So, uh, if any of you are on the email list that I get for my monthly newsletter, uh, you guys get that's all comes from that same uh, CRM. Awesome. So seeing that you're also specializing in the money raise side, utilizing that same CRM, you did a 506B. Are you able to depend on families and friends or the network that you're building relationships? What does that look like as far as being able to raise for these deals? By that question, do you mean, are you referring to the uh, having a relationship before, before someone invests with me? Is that, is that what you're referring to? Well, just, just in general, uh, we're, we're always talking about raising capital, at least Stephen and I are, and, and certainly in the community, you know, I always pointed out where it's, it's, it, it's about finding that deal and raising money for that deal. We're in a position now before we got on the, the call with you, when it rains, it pours. So, you, you know, you're, you're searching for a deal for a few months. And then one day we're, we're talking about potentially having, you know, two deals locally, um, looking at a deal in Tennessee. And now it's like, OK, the deals are here. But now what can we handle as far as that capital raise side? And yeah, we have our database with friends and family that we're able to utilize that we've warmed up yeah. over the last year, year and a half. Have you built that database where you're actually able to depend on people that you've met and develop relationships over that year and a half that you didn't necessarily fall into that friends and family category? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying. I appreciate it. I, my primary goal when I talk to somebody is to see if there's a way that I can help them. Now, does that mean uh, teach them a new skill? Does that mean help them invest in a future deal? Does that mean help them improve their property? Does that mean uh, 
help them sell their property. Maybe I buy it from them or refer them to somebody else, right? So I'm constantly looking out for how, how can I improve this person's life? And so because of that, I've built this database of people that want to invest money, whether it's with me or with somebody else. <clears throat> so the short answer is I've got a pretty substantive database where I can do a 506B raise very, very easily. Uh, I'm not afraid at all in the future to do a 506C raise. Uh, I've got several people that are uh, not just sophisticated, but accredited investors as well. Although um, I really like the 506B model uh, because it doesn't, it allows everybody, right, to, to participate, right? It doesn't eliminate anybody. So if, if I ever can, that's going to be my preference is to work with the 506B. Now, I did just meet with a syndication attorney just the other day that tells me that he has the ability to do a 506B and then convert it to a 506C. Uh, That's a new one for me. I haven't heard that I'm yet. Not, <laughs> I've not actually done it, right? But I'd be happy to give you the introduction uh, to that attorney. But huh. the, the short version is you do the 506B, you maximize that one to, to the point of return, and then you actually, in the, in the PPM, you have a date. And as of that date, you close the 506B, and you open a 506C. And now you can advertise and do everything else. I love that flexibility because if you run out of <laughs> friends and family in that database, you pivot, uh -huh. 506C, advertise, open it up to a whole nother frame of investors. Interesting. I, I love the flexibility. Uh, I, I'd love to get that introduction as well. Uh, man, how come I haven't heard that yet? <laughs> I haven't done it just to be fair. Right. Uh, so, and I have another syndication attorney that tells me you're crazy if you do that. Right? Uh, so, uh, but I will, I'll give you that. I'll give you the introduction and then it's going to be on you to, to vet that. <laughs> Uh, he, he's one of the well-known, well-known syndication attorneys out there and, uh, definitely has a name that's well-respected. So for all the hundreds or maybe thousands of hours of podcasts, yeah, I haven't heard that one, but we have run into different attorneys who say one thing is possible and another says that they're crazy. Like you said, but Sen, I, I can see why Jake and Gino hired you to be a coach. You had very professional answers here as far as raising capital, you try and provide value and that that's the best way to say it. That's what you're doing right now, being on the podcast. As far as keeping track of your acquisitions, you have a CRM, you're doing it professionally. What What's next for you and what's next for your multifamily journey? What's next for me is just continue to scale, right? So I'm, I'm very focused on uh, increasing my, my numbers. You know, I, I have this, uh, this vision statement that I'm trying to form. And so it's still not baked yet, but my vision is, is to provide 15,000 comfortable homes for families while providing passive investments for 200 friends, right? So I want to take 1500 units to provide comfortable, nice places for people to live while helping 200 of my close friends grow their future income. No, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And that's very lofty goal. That's Geez, uh, uh, 15,000 15, units or 15,000 beds. But mm -hmm. no matter how you look at it, that's that's very ambitious. And the 200 people that you're looking to make 20% IRR or whatever that looks like. What is, no, we always battle with that question too. We know that there, you know, you have different asset classes. We have the A, B, C, value add deals what is your specialty do you like the value add do you like class a what type of return metrics are you shooting for i like i like class b value add and like i said earlier primarily that op through operation i don't want to go and do a heavy lift i've done one or two of those projects where it's a real real junker and you got to put a lot of time and energy into it and, and and there's nothing wrong with that. You can make a lot of money, but it takes a long time to really get a good solid return. So I like the class B asset uh, that's going to give stable returns for my investors. <clears throat> I'm not afraid of class A, but they don't provide quite as good a return, in my opinion, 
Now, maybe they're more stable, maybe they're more safe, quote unquote. But I also think that if there is ever a recession, they're going to be one of the first that get hit. Yeah, I don't know what's safe about a two and a half cap. <laughs> I'm glad you said it, right? I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not scared of that, but it's definitely not where I would put my money. So I'm not going to ask my investors to put their money there. All right, so I like the class B uh class B product that I can increase the rents through that operational uh, process. As far as rates of return, I would say uh, if we can be over an 8% cash on cash to the investor and then clear that 20% IRR, I'm interested. Although my preference, my real preference is to be over 10% cash on cash. Now, can you do that year one? Probably not. But if in year two, three, four, uh, definitely after a refinance, no worries. So yeah, eight, eight, 10 plus, and then 20% IRR is really where I focus. And again, to the investor, that's after any splits or uh, any of those costs. Nice. So we like the same thing where you go from, you, you get that A location. You know, we'll take, we'll take a C plus, B minus asset. If it's a B plus A location, you know, we can get that very, very close to class A type property and you have the meat on the bone, so to speak. We have those returns where the class A, you're buying much more stable asset and you just don't have those returns that you can offer to your investors. Yes, there's a lot of investors that like that more stable asset, but Confirm with me, it sounds like your investors may be looking for the bigger returns where they, they like those value add deals. Yeah, for sure. Most of the investors I've talked to, you know, they're, they're, they're not multimillionaires that just have money to, to park. Uh, and mm -hmm. there are those people, right, that just need to combat inflation and park their money to pass on to the next generation. And there's nothing wrong with that. Most of my investors are still trying to grow their wealth or to be able to actually retire someday and to be able to live on the money. I'm actually working on a model. I don't have it all vetted out yet, but uh, working on where somebody comes in and invests with me a certain amount of money every, every year for five years, and I'm able to provide them uh, retirement basically. Right. And, and again, I haven't vetted it out exactly yet, but I'm working on that. And so that's the kind of person I'm looking for is somebody that needs to grow their wealth still. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Senate, this is the Collecting Real Estate Podcast. So they say you have to have three of something to make a collection. So we have three questions for you to finish this up. Nice. In five words or less, what's the most important thing you've learned since investing in real estate? I'm at the count. Uh, Begin with the end in mind. Is that five? That's that's a fantastic that answer. Works. Thank you. <laughs> so so let me clarify what that means, right? Okay. So if, if if I would have realized what I'm doing now, I probably wouldn't I would have skipped the whole single family journey and moved directly into multifamily. And and so now what I do is I, I just read this this great quote from Elon Musk that said uh, take, take your goal, your 10 year goal and figure out how to compress it into, into six months, you know? Oh, I like but, that. But if you don't have a 10 year goal, how can you compress it into six months? Yep. Good point. So begin with the end in mind. Have the end in mind. There you go. There was, there was and, someone and, else. There was someone else. I think it was on bigger pockets who said they started taking their annual goals from their company and they started to see if they could do it in one quarter and they were able to do it. And I can't remember who it was, but just, again, if you think you can, you might be able to do it. Unless you try. And that's the thing. So Elon Musk's quote that I just quoted actually goes on, right? As part of a bigger expert, which most quotes are. He actually says, you will probably fail, but you'll be a lot further ahead than anyone who didn't try. I love that. No, no doubt about it. And I'm not surprised coming from Elon Musk to turn a 10 year goal into, into a uh, six month goal. And, and you're both and students yeah, of and, Jake and Gino and Gino often says, he makes it a little more real. And he says, start with the funeral in mind. 
What do, oh, what do you boy. want people to be saying? Picture that and work backwards. Well, wow. then you have you have that other great quote too, just like what you guys are ensuing to is if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you are correct. Yeah. So no, that's great. We, you know, mindset, that's a whole nother podcast here. Second question for you, Senate, what are your one or two year personal goals? Outside of real estate. Outside of real estate. Outside of real estate. Wow. We're going to get real personal here. For personal us. goals. Yeah. So <clears throat> I am a personal development junkie. I will be the first to uh, announce to you that uh, I, I focus on personal growth and personal development. In fact, my wife and I, primarily my wife, uh, she's, she is the, uh, the crux behind this. We actually run a personal development seminar here in our hometown because we've spent tens, probably hundred thousand dollars on personal development between travel and mentorships and books and things. And a lot of people in Twin Falls either don't have the resources to do that or can't do that or just won't do that. So we want to bring that back here. And so it's called the Idaho Business Summit, where we personally bring uh, big, huge speakers. Uh, we just this last year, we had a gentleman by the name of Luke Wren, which Bill, I'm pretty sure you are familiar with him. Uh, he actually flew from Mount Everest to Twin Falls, Idaho to speak at this, this summit and then back to Mount Everest. <clears throat> and he's actually coming back next year, which I could get on a whole rant about that, right? Uh, how, how awesome the Idaho Business Summit is and how amazing it has been and what we're going to accomplish. So uh, I'm going to give you a couple of goals. So number one, this next year, we're going to sell that conference out. We're going to sell that out. And then I don't know which one for sure yet, but I'm going to join another mastermind. I've actually got, uh, got a couple of different masterminds that I've got lined up to be able to join that a uh, couple of different masterminds, one, one of a couple of different masterminds. Uh, they're fairly expensive and take a big time commitment to be able to do. <clears throat> and then uh, the big one that I'm trying to figure out uh, is Tony Robbins. Everybody knows Tony Robbins, right? He's got a thing called the Platinum Partnership, which for my wife and I to do this is about a three or $400,000 commitment. And so uh, that quote I actually gave you from Elon Musk is really pushing <laughs> that up to that two-year goal. So that was a five-year goal for me, was to be able to join the Platinum Partnership. And Luke Wren actually told me over a golf trip, you gotta figure out how to do that in two years. I don't know how to do it yet, but uh, that's there's three things, right? Sell out the Personal Development Summit, the Idaho Business Summit. Join one of these masterminds, right? Which maybe Luke's, maybe uh, GoFundance, right? There's a couple of ones that I'm looking at. And then figure out how to join the Platinum Partnership. That's awesome. Very, very, very impressive. The world is shrinking for me and you. I'm, I'm currently in Luke Wren's mastermind, so... I, I talked to him earlier this week and I'll be talking to him early next week. So, uh, you know, he's an amazing individual and boy, does he provide massive value. Last yeah. question for you. How can we and the listeners assist you and how do we contact you? Well, so uh, how can you assist me? <clears throat> Uh, two things, right? Well, three things. So I'm always looking for for investors, right? If you know somebody that wants to invest uh, and get those great rates of returns, diversify maybe out of the stock market and get into something uh, with a more passive real estate investment uh, with great tax advantages. We didn't even talk about tax advantages on this, but I'm sure your listenership knows about that already. So somebody that wants to to get to know me, I'd love to get jump on a call and get to know them and see if we're a fit for each other. Uh, and if we are, maybe we do a deal together in the future. I'm also always looking for deals, right? So if you know a good deal uh, that uh, somebody has for sale or uh, a property owner that doesn't, doesn't uh, wanna manage their property more and wants to sell it, if I can't take it down, I probably know somebody that can, right? Know people like Bill, right? That's a perfect example. I know people that can do that. And the third thing is I like partners. Right. So if somebody, you know, somebody that needs a good partner, somebody that one of my skill sets can help or my partner, Chris Carney can help. Right. I'd love an introduction in that realm and uh, be able to be able to grow our, our partnerships. 
As far as getting all of me, I'm actually pretty easy to find. I'm active on social media uh, uh, with, and also on Bigger Pockets. And my website is probably the easiest way. It's just senateskridge.com. Spelled just like it sounds, just like one of the Congress people. I'm, I'm really glad neither of you made a politics joke. I really appreciate that. But uh, <laughs> just like it, I'm pretty easy to find. You Google, Google Senate Eskridge, you're going to find me. So senateskridge.com. Let's jump on a meeting. Uh, just get to know each other. I love the network and get to know people. That's fantastic. Senate is investing in Columbus, Oklahoma, Texas, and his home state of Idaho. So yeah, contact Senate if you want to get some information on some of those deals you might be interested in. Senate, thank you so much for being on the Collecting Real Estate and we'll, Show. We'll put a link to the website in the description, in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was a great time. Great conversation. I quite enjoyed this. So maybe we'll do it again someday. Absolutely. Let's uh, do it again someday and we'll, we'll get into some more mindset stuff. And uh, I'm sure we can um, get an update on your, your latest deals at that point as well. We'll do it again in a year or so. And we'll need to have a collection, right? Correct. Does that mean we need three episodes? Yes. Oh, first person to say that. I like that. Yeah. And we'll Fantastic. hear all about your sold out conference next year. Yes, you will. Awesome. Right, Thank thanks, you, Senate. Senate. Thanks. Thank you.